In several of the prophetic books of the Bible, God Almighty told the prophet, go speak to this people. They won't listen. They'll not turn. They'll not hear you. It'll be a thankless job. No matter what you say to convict them, it will not do any good. And yet, you must go and speak my words anyway. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 to 16, I'll start in verse 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, or that are becoming perfect spiritually. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world, that come to nothing, come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. It's as if God has pulled a blinder over the eyes of the people. They do not understand. They don't comprehend. They don't, they don't know what's going on. They, under no circumstances, realize that there is a purpose for human beings. They all long for peace, just like one song that a lady sang from a distance. Everything looks peaceful. It looks happy. It looks okay. And yet, when you come down close and put a microscope upon everything, there's wars, rumors of wars, famine, everything that mankind desires, it's the exact opposite. And yet God is the one responsible. And therefore he will be responsible for correcting the situation. And yet anyway, he told his people or his ministry, go preach, even though few will even listen. You go preach anyway. Verse 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Nobody, and I mean this sincerely, nobody on the face of the earth can understand the overall purpose of what God is doing unless God's Holy Spirit reveals it to them. God chooses. God selects at this time. That's why he says for his ministers to go and preach and they will not hear. And yet you go preach anyway. That's why Paul said, it's like I'm on a stage and the whole world is watching me and I look silly and foolish to them. And yet God said, do it. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. It's God's Holy Spirit. For what, this is verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 2. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? You and I communicate with each other because we understand language, English, if we were French and we both spoke the French language, we could communicate because there is a spirit God put within us to give us the capability of communication. Even so, the things of God, no man knows. Nobody. But the spirit of God, God's Holy Spirit is what reveals it. Nobody can understand it. You and I didn't just go looking for God and all of a sudden we found him. You cannot discover the things of the Bible if God's Holy Spirit does not give that information to you and let you understand this book. Verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. Notice there is two contrasting spirits. One that's of the world that cannot know God. The other is God's Spirit that reveals. That's why when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and to every true believer after that, it says that God's Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth, not continue in mystery Babylon and in all error. John 16, 13 says you, it will lead you into all truth that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak not in the words of man's wisdom. See, man's wisdom doesn't teach us of God, but which the Holy Spirit 
teaches. Why? Because it compares spiritual things with spiritual. And yet we cannot compare on the human level anything but physical with physical, not spiritual. Verse 14, but the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. There it is. I believe the Bible. This is why very few ever understand the overall truth of what's in this book. God said many are called. He puts out the call to open the minds, but few are called. Many are called, but few actually follow through with a call. They will not heed the following of the Holy Spirit, even when it begins to draw them. Verse 15, but he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Those that God has called, truly chosen, and has placed his Holy Spirit within their mind, will begin to grow and understand this Bible. Those that are have the spirit of the world will not understand what you know. They will pick little parts out of the Bible, a verse, and build a whole church around it. And the rest of the Bible is lying there dormant because their mind cannot grasp it and comprehend it. Why am I saying these things today? Because I'm going to lead into a prophetic message. In first or second Corinthians chapter six, verse 14 to 18. This world is not where a true Christian should be. I don't mean that we can be taken out of the world. Paul said we can't. We must live within the confines and the geography of planet earth, but we're not to participate with the false religions of this world, and I'm going to prove where it's going to lead if you do. Verse 14, 2 Corinthians 6. Be you not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? In Psalms 119, verse 172, it says, All thy commandments are righteousness. Those who claim to be Christians who are not keeping the commandments of God are not righteous. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. The truth always hurts. It cuts. Those who are righteous are keeping the commandments of God. The Bible said so, and we only preach Jesus Christ here. And what he said, not about him, but what he said and how to live. What communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial, or the devil? Or what part hath he that believes with an infidel? Remember that verse right there. How can a person who claims to have the Holy Spirit of God and know these verses that it says, come out of the world, be not a part of the world, be separate, and you are not to have communion with an infidel, a non-believer, one that does not believe Jesus Christ is the son of the living God and the only way for salvation. Remember this verse later on in my sermon. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the, li are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, that's non-believers, infidels, those that do not believe that Jesus Christ is a son of the living God, those who do not bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And be you separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean, and I'll receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 5, it says, And upon her, refer, referring to a great end-time church system, for it was a name written. Notice what is written. Even in the Bible, it's capitalized. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. 
Notice now, this is a religious system. Verse 1 through 4 identifies it as a fallen woman, and a woman in Bible terminology many times symbolizes a church. This is a fallen woman. A man by the name of Jack Van Impey wrote a book called Revelation Unveil. He asked a question in that book. He said, who is the mother? Mystery Babylon the Great. Then another man by the name of Clarence Larkin states that Babylon or Babel, the Tower of Babel, if we remember from Genesis chapter 10, was built by Nimrod. This city was the seat of the first great apostasy. Here the Babylonian cult, a mystery system claiming to possess the highest wisdom and to reveal the divine secrets of the universe was invented. Babylon. Before a member could be initiated into this, he had to confess his sins to a priest. The priest then knew his secret sins and had power over him to keep him under control. Once a man went into this order and was initiated into it, he no longer was a Babylonian. He no longer was an Assyrian, an Egyptian. He had no national identity. They became members of a mystical brotherhood over whom was placed a pontiff or high priest. The high priest or pontiff's word was law. The city of Babylon continued to be the seat of Satan until the fall of the Babylonian and the Medo-Persian Empire. At that particular time, Satan shifted his capital to Pergamos in Asia Minor, where it is still located when the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation because he recorded in chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, that that was Satan's seat. Atalus was the pontiff and king of Pergamos at that time. This man died in 133 B.C. He bequeathed the headship of the Babylonian priesthood to Rome. When the Etruscans came to Italy from Lydia, which was an area around Pergamos, they brought with them all the Babylonian religion with all of its rituals. And the Roman Empire accepted it because the head of the Roman Empire became the pontiff or high priest, and he was considered a god, and his word was law. They also set up this pontiff as the head of the priesthood. And later on, when the Romans accepted the pontiff as their civil ruler, Julius Caesar was made the first supreme pontiff of the Babylonian order. He became heir to all the rights, all the titles of Atalus, the pontiff of Pergamos. So this made Rome the heir of the Babylonian mystery religions. The first Babylonian emperor became the head of the Babylonian priesthood. And therefore later, when the bishop of Rome became head of all religion in the Roman Empire, he took on the name of of pontiff. There are two books in the Bible, the book of Daniel and the book of Revelations, which are for the last days. Daniel was told in no uncertain terms that the book that he wrote and bears his name was closed to all understanding until the time of the end. Notice now Daniel 12, verse 8 and 9. And I, Daniel, heard but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And then, of course, the Lord said to him in a dream, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Now, how do we know that this means our day? Did Daniel put identifying signs within the pages of the Bible, his book, 
so that we could know without doubt that we're living in the time of the end. In Daniel 12, verse 3, it says, They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. That's the resurrection to glory. That has not occurred yet. So we know we're preceding the resurrection at this time, but where in history? Look now in Daniel 12, verse 4. But you, O Daniel, shut up the word, seal the book, even till the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro. That's world travel. People talk about jet lag. They can go around the world in a matter of hours now, all the way around the world and have meetings at strategic places in one day. And knowledge shall be increased. Right now, knowledge in the scientific world doubles every two and a half years. I believe that's rapid increase of knowledge. John was given the book of Revelation. In Revelation 1, 1, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. The phrase, shortly come to pass, in the original Greek, meant that when history had reached a certain point, then suddenly the book of Revelation would come alive. All the events within that book would suddenly begin to take place. When would this take place? The time setting is the day of the Lord. In Revelation 1 verse 10, it says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. I know of churches that build whole doctrines of why they go to church every Sunday because of the phrase, on the Lord's day. And yet, when you look in the concordance and look up the Greek word for the preposition on, it's E-N, and it means on, at, by. It's four different prepositions. It can be any one, but it must fit the context. And this verse is the time setting for the book of Revelation. It should have read, I was in the Spirit in the Lord's day. It's like John was project projected forward into a time machine into the day of the Lord. The very final preparatory time right before the resurrection from the dead and the resurrection of the saints. Every world government in the past has known that it must be accompanied by a spiritual religious organization also. In order to subjugate the minds of man, they must be able to subjugate what is called the religious aspect that every person has. We're born with an innate desire to worship something or to believe in something. And so every government that has succeeded has accompanied with it a world religion. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 to 18, it describes a religious figure who is secretly backed by a dragon. And we know the book of Revelation identifies who the dragon is, Satan the devil in Revelation 21 to 3, and also Revelation 12, verse 9 to 12. He also is identified in Revelation 19, verse 20, as a false prophet. There is coming someone on the world scene, not just a local area, who will be instrumental in deceiving the entire world into following what we have come to call this individual, this political ruler, the Antichrist. They're going to deceive him into following that person in blind obedience through the use of miracles. President George Bush has chosen the United Nations organization as the primary political entity to head what he called the New World Order. And it's not very hard to discover the philosophy behind the United Nations organization. Almost without exception, since the founding of the United Nations organization, the UN has been anti-American, anti-Christian, anti-every value that is at the heart and the core of the Bible. Actually, President George Bush could probably have chosen the KGB of the former Soviet Union, and he would have been better off. 
because the United Nations organization promotes heathenism, paganism, everything that is anti-God and anti-Christian. I want to read a poem that was written by a former communist who's dead now. He put it on paper and the lyrics. This was played on the anniversary of John Lennon's death. John Lennon wrote it and sang it, and most everybody here will recognize the song. Quote, Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. And I'll interrupt if you want to be a socialist and atheist, it's real easy. Now I'll continue. No hell below us, above us only sky. In other words, there's no God out there. Imagine all the people living for today. Why live for today? Because there is no future. When you die, that's it. You're like Rover, dead all over. Imagine there's no country. What did the Illuminati say back in 1776? Eliminate borders, make it one world, one happy family. No United States, no separate nation of Canada, no Mexico. All the world, one happy family. John Lennon is parroting exactly what the Illuminati laid down in 1776. And the United Nations organization played it on the anniversary of his death to the whole world. He went on to say, it isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. In other words, we don't have a nation to protect against another nation, so there's no reason to go to war. And no religion. And it's an absolute fact. Most wars are fought over religion. It's just a fact of history. But if there's no religion, there's no reason to go to war, is there? Imagine all the people living in peace. Imagine no possessions. Isn't that socialism? Right down the line. I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger. Why? Because they're going to redistribute all the wealth of the world. Everybody will have an equal amount of poverty. I'll continue. A brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. You may say, I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. End of quote. The Bible has perfectly foretold this one-world religious order. It has gone into detail. I want to read that from Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 through 18. This religious system is going to be headed up by a leader called a false prophet. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. Remember in verse 1, there was a beast that was the political leader. <clears throat> now there is a religious leader. And he had two horns like a lamb. He spake as a dragon. So here is someone that clasps his hands. He folds them together in fake humility. And when he speaks off the cameras, though, he is in cahoots to plot world government because that individual feels that he has total supreme authority. He has the God-given right to rule every nation on the face of the earth, every inch of geography. Wherever a human being lives, he has the God-given temporal power to rule and control that human being's destiny. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him. The political gave the religious the power and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He does great wonders, so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, they're going to, he, this person is going to cause everyone to worship the political dictator, <clears throat> which had the wound by the sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, 
So there's going to be some type of image that the image of the beast, notice what it's going to do, should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell except or save in the King James, he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man and his number is six or th- six hundred three score and six or six hundred sixty six. Now there's several functions of this religious order that I feel are clearly described in this scripture. This political organization will fit perfectly with the new world order as President Bush calls it. Notice now this new world religion will have the same power and authority as the new world political order. They will work hand in glove enforcing the political and religious aspects upon mankind. And he's given all the authority that it requires to force people to worship a false Messiah. This religious giant, whoever he is, and I think we all really know, will also have the power to cause the image of the beast, whatever that is, to pronounce judgment upon anyone who will not worship the political dictator as Messiah. This statue, whatever it is, or image, I believe is referred to by Jesus Christ in Matthew 24, verse 15, where it's called the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And you can go back to Daniel 9 and Daniel 11 and 12 and see the abomination of desolation. It will be installed in a resurrected temple or some type of shrine or edifice in Jerusalem. And they'll start offering daily sacrifices, which they've already trained their priests to do. They've been in preparation since 1968. All they need now is some type of peace treaty, according to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. And when that peace treaty is established, then the last seven years will begin. The New World Religious Order will actually be the force behind the mark of the beast. It's the religious figure that everyone can trust because this individual says he's moral. I don't believe that it's going to be just a marking system. I believe it's going to be prefaced with a requirement that every one of us be identified by worshiping the false Messiah. Then you can go into the new age and they will give you the mark that allows you to buy and sell, supply food, energy, and so on for your family. Therefore, you will be initiated in to this unholy trinity. Satan, because he's giving power, the beast, that's the political, and the false prophet, that's the third person. All three of them combined will give power to this end-time system. The description of this religious system even becomes clearer when we go to Revelation chapter 17. Here's the description of the false prophet. Verse 3, the great whore is going to be riding a scarlet colored beast, and it's going to be full of blasphemy. So what I'm going to do now is go to verse 1. I'll break into it and read down through verse 6. Come here, I'll show unto you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. See, she is a false church, a fallen church, and she has doctrines but they are not God's doctrines. And therefore, when these kings of the earth accept her as the one world religion, they will be 
committing spiritual fornication. So he carried me away into the in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold, precious stones, pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written. Notice this very carefully. Mystery, Babylon the Great. What does the word Babylon mean? Confusion. The mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman, this great religious system, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now let's notice a few of the characteristics here. This religious system is called a whore. It's unfaithful to Jesus Christ. It's a fornicator, fornicator, and it is guilty of changing, twisting, and debauching the word of God. To be exact, they go so far in their own written literature, which we have two volumes approved by the Vatican. And they state no Catholic is to read any literature that is not written by other Catholics. And they're forbidden to read the Bible unless it is approved Bible, which they put out. God has pronounced judgment upon any individual who adds to or subtracts from the word of God. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 and 19, for I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Read Revelation 16, the seven last plagues. If any man shall take away from the words of the prophecy of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. So. If we want to take anything out of this book and not tell the truth, God will banish us from New Jerusalem forever. It's that simple. There will be no inheritance as a first fruit in God's resurrection. There will be no better resurrection for someone who takes away from this book. That means we had better be careful what we say about God's word. And yet this religious system burned Bibles and gave the orders to do so in 1229 or 1279, I forget, A.D. Notice another characteristic. She's rich. She spends her riches on herself. She's proud and pompous, egotistical, worldly, decks herself with costly jewels. And she drank from a golden cup. Notice, not a plastic or styrofoam, but a golden cup. And its contents became an abomination and vileness to God because the contents that she was feeding the world was worthless and destructive. Another characteristic, she is a mother of harlots. What is a harlot? It's someone who is unfaithful to Jesus Christ. I want to tell a true story that just happened recently. I made contact with a church group, went there, preached to them. They were elated. They were joyous at the new truth they could learn. The minister there was paid by the local church. He could not speak the truth because he would lose his salary. Within a few months, all of a sudden, the whole church turns and this minister turns against everything that we stand for because the man 
who was called the elder of the church there that paid the salary to the minister, built the building, owned the building, had it deeded in his name. And therefore, if that minister taught the truth, he was kicked out on the street. That's called a prostitute. They won't teach the truth. And how are all the churches in America set up today? God Almighty said, I will choose apostles, prophets, and I will send them. They lead the church. They don't pay his salary. They only give to the church organization because he is God's man. And yet the churches have it where they set up boards and they hire a preacher. And he can't preach the truth because he tell them to repent. They got it backwards. God's ministers are to be free to preach the truth or they're harlots. A fourth characteristic. Her greatest hatred is for the true believers who hold on to the Bible and its infallible truths. That's why this organization is full of the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ and of the saints. Nothing is more vile than as religion that's gone astray. Let's notice now what is happening in the religious community. There is an ecumenical movement today to bring all churches of the world together under one banner. It's going to be a new world religion along with a new world order. It's called the ecumenical movement, and there's going to be a movement that is already underfoot to bring all religions back into the Catholic fold. Do we believe that that is possible? 20 years ago, most people, or 30 years ago, most people were afraid to even have John F. Kennedy, a Catholic, elected as president of the United States because they knew the first loyalty was always to the Pope. Now let's notice what some Protestant ministers are saying today. Dr. Robert Schuler, quoted directly from the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, September 19th, 1987. Quote, it's time for the Protestants to go to the shepherd, the Pope, and say, what do we have to do to come home? End of quote. What about United States of America ministers? All in one newspaper article, the Montgomery Advisor, September 12th, 1987, quote, Heads of the American Protestant and Eastern Orthodox churches who were meeting with the Pope John Paul II on Friday hailed their first broadly representative discussion as a landmark on the road to greater unity. The Reverend Donald Jones, a United Methodist and chairman of the, Uni of the University of South Carolina Religious Studies Department, termed it the most important ecumenical meeting of the century. The Reverend Paul A. Crow, Jr. of Indianapolis, ecumenical officer of the Christian Church, that's Disciples of Christ, called it a new day in ecumenism opening a future in which God is drawing us together, end of quote. Just one statement went through my mind. Remember Jesus saying, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find the faith in the earth? And yet all these people are saying God is drawing us all together. Notice what the Anglican Church, the leader of that church, said as reported in the Dallas Morning News, October 1st, 1989, by the Associated Press. Quote, Anglican leader Archbishop Robert Runsey called Saturday for all Christians to accept the Roman Catholic Pope as a common leader presiding in love. For the Universal Church, I renew the plea, he said, could not all Christians come to reconsider the kind of primacy the Bishop of Rome exercised within the early church? End of quote. Now, you would think 
the Baptist church would have absolutely nothing in common with the Catholic church. If you understand some of their basic tenets, and yet listen to what was recorded in the Bakersfield, Californian, Bakersfield, California, August 27th, 1989, by the Associated Press. Quote, Southern Baptists and Roman Catholics, the nation's two largest denominations, generally have been regarded as doctrinally far apart, but their scholars find they basically agree. The 163-page report is seen as the most full-scale mutual examination of respective positions of the two traditions. Achieving it was an unprecedented experience for Southern Baptists, commonly adverse to ecumenical affairs. The talks, sponsored by the Catholic Bishops Committee on Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs and the Southern Baptist Department of Interfaith Witness, involved 18 meetings between 1987 and 1988, end of quote. The World Council of Churches had a meeting in Australia. They stated that within their own literature that was published February 13th, 1991, when they had their meeting in Australia, there included with it not only what was termed Christian churches, but they also had listed on the agenda as people who wanted to be a part of the world religious system, a Buddhist monk from Sri Lanka, which used to be called Ceylon, just south of India, an island. The World Council of Churches chose to open its seventh assembly. This is in Australia with a ceremonial welcome that was performed by pagans from Australia. Aboriginal witch doctors performed an animalistic ceremony to welcome Catholics, Presbyterians, Methodists, American Baptists, and all the rest that are members of the World Council of Churches to their seventh meeting. Now, the religion of these pagans is animalistic. They worship everything. They believe that God is in everything. Trees, animals, insects, humans. It's They worship the cosmos as God. That's very important to understand. Now, I'm quoting now directly from Assembly Line, the official publication of the World Council of Churches for their February 7th, 1991 meeting in Australia. Quote, not only did they perform, but all the worshipers at the assembly opening session were forced, if they attended, to enter the assembly hall through a pagan cleansing ritual. Hmm, interesting. Here's what it said. Quote, the worship began with an Australian aboriginal ritual. Participants entered the tent through the smoke of burning branches, a traditional aboriginal cleansing ritual. End of quote. Notice now, here were people who were cleansed without the shed blood of Jesus Christ. They went into an assembly supposedly to unite all religions of the world that are called Christian and they had a pagan ceremony. And they were cleansed through their ceremony instead of requiring anyone who attended to be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of their sins and come under the shed blood of Jesus and accept him as their one and only Savior. No wonder God calls it mystery, Babylon and the great confusion, merging of supposed biblical principles with paganism but leaving the shed blood of Jesus out. And there can be no salvation outside the shed blood of Jesus Christ. To be exact, I'll go so far as to say those people who attended and went through this aboriginal cleansing ritual blasphemed. 
Whatever happened to the commandment that Jesus Christ gave personally when he was standing on the top of Mount Sinai, he said, you shall have no other gods before me. And 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4 said that the person who led Israel was Christ. So Jesus Christ, before he emptied himself of godhood and came into the flesh, said, you shall have no other gods before me. And yet here are people who said, I am a Christian, went through a pagan cleansing ritual before they could enter the World Council of Churches ceremony. Well, this particular article put out by the official organization, the World Council of Churches, went on and talked about people who attended. One of them was an Agnes Palmer of Alice Springs. She said, and I quote, This is the power we have through our dreaming and the power of Jesus, who came not to destroy our culture, and she was a pagan, see, but to fulfill it. So even though she used the name Jesus, she still talked about her pagan customs and that Jesus came along and he's only a dream. Let's notice what's happening in some of the religious organizations of the world today. The faiths of the world, the Islamic faith, every religious entity of significance seems to have some form of expectancy that there is coming a new world religion. All of them do. The Muslims or Muslims, they promote right now a world constitution that's rooted in their Quran theology, not the Christian faith. They're the fastest growing religion in the world right now. And yet, they spread the very tenets of Antichrist because they reject Jesus as the one and only Savior. What about the charismatic and the Pentecostal movements today? This is a very large portion of the world. It's one of the la largest and fastest growing movements within what is termed Christianity. They are now going crazy over what is called kingdom dominion theology, where they will take the world for Christ, set up a world Christian religion, and then Christ will come back to be at the head of it. Anyone who buys this is buying deception. It's a lie. The Bible says that the very elect in Matthew 21 or 24, 21, and 22, would be the only ones that will be left. And that's why Jesus Christ is coming to stop this world from destroying itself because there's a handful of people called the very elect, and that's all that's left obeying him. So these people are caught up in deception. What about the Catholic Church? Is it now outdated from the Middle Ages, or does it have the same political agenda it's always had? I'm going to give two quotes, one of them 50 years ago, one of them 114 years ago. Tell me if you can distinguish between the two. I will quote this from the America Catholic Periodical, January 4th, 1941. Quote, they, referring to Protestants, conveniently forget that they separated from us, not we from them. And that is for them to return to unity on Catholic terms. Not for us Catholics to seek union with them or to accept it on their terms. Protestantism is rebellion against the authority of Christ vested in his church. It neither possesses authority or has any desire to submit to authority. Protestantism has really proved to be the ally of paganism. All forms of Protestantism are unjustified. They should not exist. End of quote. That was 50 years ago. I will quote now from 114 years ago. 
from the Catholic World, August of 1877. I guess that'd be 115 years ago. Volume 25, page 620. Quote, We believe in the triumph of the Catholic Church over infidelity, heresy, schism. What is schism? Protestantism. Revolution and despotism over Judaism, Mohammedism, and heathenism. The restoration of the Pope's temporal kingdom, that's physical kingdom on this earth, is necessary to this triumph. And therefore, we believe it will be restored. End of quote. Now do we see why all these churches are rushing to join in with the Catholic Church? There is a worldwide conspiracy, not only for a one-world government, but a one-world religion. And they believe that the Pope has temporal power and he has the authority by Jesus Christ to rule over every land mass on the face of the earth. And you and I are in rebellion. But I've got a surprise. We're not Protestants. We're not protesting the Catholic Church. We know it's a whore. We're not protesting the Protestant churches. We know they're the daughters. We come straight from the Bible, the Word of God. New Agers, what about this group? There is no religious entity today that is pushing more for their New Age religion than the New Agers. They represent every strain of thought and they network in big companies and corporations my daughter works for McDonnell Douglas Corporation. They're requiring them to take New Age seminars over there. And they're doing it in businesses all over. Benjamin Krim is one of their big key voices, and he's demon-possessed. I know a person who sat in a meeting and said you could feel the demons. It was just like they put you in a hypnotic state, and then he would give his information. He's the one that came out in the early 1980s, 1982, I believe it was, with full-page ads in every major newspaper in the world announcing that the Christ is now here. What about Bible believers? What about somebody that really does believe in the Bible who are not willing to give in to this New Age theology? I want to make a prediction right now. And anyone who has turned and left many of the false teachings that are in all the churches, you'll know this is the truth. Those who have not done this yet, you will find out if you do. When you withdraw from all the holidays that are promoted by Christianity today that is not found in the Bible, every friend you have comes after you, don't they? They put pressure on you that is so unparalleled you've never experienced it in your life before. This is the religious crowd, the hatred that's vented out upon you and me who have come out of Mystery Babylon. It's Satan's system. Anybody who dares to come out of Mystery Babylon is the target of everybody that's still within the system. Because if you're not on God's side, you're on the other side by forfeit. Whether you know it or acknowledge it or not, you are on the opposite side. Faith in the infallible word of the living God, this Bible, and the saturation of its all of its doctrines is imperative if everyone on this earth is to turn from Babylonianism. And yet God said they won't believe me, so they won't believe you, the minister I send. They won't do it. In Revelation 17, 3, I read this before. It said that John was carried out into the wilderness in spirit, in a vision, in a dream. He saw this woman riding this beast system. And she was blasphemous. Notice what's going to happen to the system ultimately. In Revelation 17, 16, the political system that's rising will ultimately do this. And the ten horns which you saw upon the beast shall hate the whore, the religious system, and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Interesting, isn't it? That the political is going to turn upon the religious. It's only using the religious system. 
I want to make an observation. I realize sometimes I say things that are pretty hard to take. But if it's the truth, it's the truth, isn't it? Remember when President George Bush was about to declare war on Iraq? Who did he call from the religious world to the White House? Dr. Billy Graham. We should have known there was something wrong when he called Dr. Graham to the White House to ask blessing upon the introduction of the New World Order because newspaper articles came out immediately after that where Dr. Billy Graham was asking for people in all churches to pray for the New World Order. Now, I've got a question. Remember back in the first two scriptures that I read to in introduce this whole message? One of them said that the Bible is spiritually discerned and that we can only understand it if we have God's Holy Spirit. Anyone with an ounce of sense, spiritual sense, knows that the Bible from one end to the other, the good news is that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Man cannot set up a kingdom that will produce peace and happiness and offer salvation. The good news, and why doesn't Dr. Graham say it, that God is the answer? Why didn't he say it to the people instead of George Bush's New World Order? He also received his doctorate degree honorary from the Catholic Church. Interesting, isn't it? Jesus Christ is about to come. He is going to come in the lifetime of probably every person sitting in this room. I want to read now, because of time, a list of churches that are listed in the 1989 World Council of Churches publication called One World. The churches that are official members of that organization. The American or African Methodist Episcopal Church. The African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. American Baptist Churches in the USA. Apostolic Catholic Assyrian Church of the East. Christian Church, that's Disciples of Christ. Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. Church of the Brethren. Episcopal Church. Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Hungarian Reform Church in America. International Council of Community Churches. International Evangelical Church. Moravian Church in America. Northern Province and Southern Province. National Baptist Convention of America. National Baptist Convention USA Incorporated. Polish National Catholic Church. Presbyterian Church USA. Progressive National Baptist Convention. Reform Church in America. Religious Society of Friends. United Church of Christ. United Methodist Church. There is a whole list of other churches that are now in cooperation with the World Council of Churches, the National Council of Churches, but they are not considered direct members. They are only cooperating with and looking for areas in which they can cooperate. And you know what? Some of those churches are and I'm not going to mention them all, the whole list of them, just a couple of them that will be of interest to us. Seventh-day Baptists and the Seventh-day Adventists. A meeting was held in St. Louis, Missouri in 1991. Notice an article that came out about that meeting. It was found in the St. Louis Metro Voice, Volume 1, Page 6, Page 1, entitled Crusade Impacts City. Quote, After a year of planning, the Billy Graham Crusade Association held the Ralph Bell Crusade in St. Louis. Dr. Bell spoke to crowds of over 5,000 each night from Wednesday through Sunday at the arena. 
Among the lasting effects on the St. Louis community are the relationships that were established through this crusade. Notice what the relationships were. According to Littlefield, this is one of their uh, uh, people who give their statements out to the press. In the 1973 crusade, there was no participation from the Roman Catholic Church. And in this crusade, 31 Catholic parishes in St. Louis participated. And then a quote. One of the highlights of this crusade was the opportunity to work with the Catholic Church and its leadership here in St. Louis. End of quote. Are those in high places rushing to join the Catholic Church for world religion? Yes, they are. Prophecy is being fulfilled before our very eyes. In 1 John 4 verse 1 it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit. You see, there are invisible spirit beings called demons that have rebelled against God. Then there are angels that are ministering spirits of God that are there for us to minister unto us. He says to try the spirits to know which you're dealing with. But try the spirits whether they are of God. And the inference is, or not, because many false prophets are gone into the world. You and I must know. And I'm going to make a statement now, and this primarily is for anyone who ever watches this on television or hears it on radio. If you belong to a church organization that's a part of the World Council of Churches, National Council of Churches, whether it's an official member or cooperating with it, and they are giving money to either of those organizations, you better get out because you are helping to promote the false prophet and the antichrist that is coming on the scene. Your money is going directly for that support. And in reality, you're saying, I want this new world organization without Jesus Christ. So you need to come out. In Revelation 18, 3 and 4, Jesus Christ instructed them to come out of Mystery Babylon. He said, come out of her, my people. There are people out there that do not have complete understanding of this Bible. But they're still God's people. But he's requiring them to come out of this system and its false doctrines and the confusion that it's going to promote. I just want to give you one other example of something that took place at this particular organization. I'm going to, uh, this World Council of Churches meeting in Australia in February of 1991. Here is the headline from the Australian. That's a newspaper down there. Monday, February 11th, 1991. All faiths are one with God. World Council of Churches. Hinduism. Muslims, pagan, aboriginals down there that they use their cleansing ritual. Every one of them are equal with the Christian community, according to the World Council of Churches. Whatever happened to salvation through Jesus Christ? Acts 4.12, there is no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. Not multiple choice, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism. Shintoism, Muslimism, no, there is not multiple choice. It is a statement. There is no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. Not maybe, might, but must. There is no other way. If that's fanaticism, give me fanaticism because that is spiritually discerned. And these other people in these religious movements cannot understand it. They went on in their official document and in speeches from the pulpit down there, stating that the Christian community was looking in too narrow of a perspective and that the Christian community was going to have to change and have a larger perspective of who can come to God. No, 
True Christians never change their perspective. There is only one way, and that is through the name of Jesus Christ and no one else. To be exact, after this was announced from the pulpit that Christians were too narrow in their thinking of who could come to God and had a relationship with God, a woman from Korea stood up and talked to the people. She addressed the meeting and said, quote, For me, the image of the Holy Spirit comes from the message of Quan In. This is a woman. She is venerated as goddess. See, every pagan religion has a goddess that they worship. What does the Catholic Church worship? Do they worship God the Father and Jesus primarily? No, it's the Virgin Mary. Goddess worship, the Queen of Heaven. She is venerated as goddess of compassion and wisdom by Eastern Asian women. She is Bad Hasarov, enlightened being. See? She can go into nirvana. Now, she claims to be a Christian from Korea. See? And yet they're talking about Hinduism and so on. Nirvana. She can go into nirvana anytime she wants to, but refuses to go into nirvana by herself. Her compassion for all suffering living beings makes her stay in this world, enabling other living beings to achieve enlightenment. All it is is a demon. That's all it is. I'll continue her statement before this whole assembly of supposed Christians. Her compassionate wisdom heals all forms of life and empowers them to swim to the shore of nirvana. She waits and waits until the whole universe, people, trees, mountains, air, water, becomes enlightened. In other words, she worships the earth, physical things, not God, a literal God with a body like us that we're made in the image of. She is worships nature. She's not a Christian. She's a heathen. I'll continue. They can go to Nirvana together where they can live collectively in eternal wisdom and compassion. Perhaps this might also be a feminine image of the Christ who is the firstborn among us, one who goes before and brings others with her. Then her speech ended with aboriginal dancers. And according to the newspaper article that carried this, they said for the sake of decency, they would not describe the dance. This is in the name of the Christian unity and a one world religion. The World Council of Churches. Well, I want to give a few quotes for, from some people that were first-hand eyewitnesses and they came away from this World Council of Churches 7th Annual Meeting. Here is a David Coffey, the pastor who is to become the General Secretary of the Baptist Union of Great Britain over all the Baptist churches in Great Britain. Quote, I feel very positive here and will go back home to be an advocate of the World Council of Churches. Here's what Peter Z uh, Kuzmik, K-U-Z-M-I-C, a Pentecostal leader from Yugoslavia, quote, I don't have problems with people who think differently. You know, there's a problem with God, though. He does. It does not help us to withdraw into an ecclesiastical ghetto and complain from there. End of quote. So he was willing to accept heathenism. I say that the World Council of Churches and its National Council of Church branch in America has compromised, and it is a political organization for world government. It has nothing to do with Jesus Christ, but it is promoting the abolition of Jesus and his shed blood from the Bible. And I've got the proof to back it up. They're trying to do everything they can to have new translations of the Bible and delete the word blood so that the blood of Jesus is no longer required 
for Christians to have a relationship with supposedly him. Well, I want to start bringing this to a close today with a few statements from newspaper articles. Because I want you to know, without doubt, that Bible prophecy is here. This world religion, world government is just around the corner. It's on the brink. We don't know every moment in God's timetable. Only he does. But we're commanded to watch, and we're going to watch. Pope John Paul II. It's what he said to the Presbyterian Church, the United States of America. Quote, John Paul II called Sunday for interfaith efforts for world peace and said true Christians do not just trouble themselves with the hereafter. He said the time of religious warfare is past and Christians must work with other religions to secure peace. End of quote. Other religions, Hinduism and the rest. I'll continue. This is his statement. There is a growing awareness that humanity has a profound unity of interest vocation, destiny, and that all peoples are called to form a single family. The grave threats that hang over its future are not merely a noble appeal meant for a few idealists, but a condition for survival itself. End of quote, Pope John Paul II. So he's calling for world religion, world government, with all religions, not just Christian. That's why he went to meet on the Isle of uh, Sissy several years ago, non-Christian faith leaders. The Associated Press, quote, Pope John Paul II urged all religions Wednesday to work together against political, ideology, ide ideological, and economic tensions that he said threaten the survival of mankind. He said there's a growing conviction that something must be urgently done to secure peace and development that are conditions for a better future for the whole human race. Notice what he said now. Remember when he speaks from the chair, ex cathedra, it's infallible. It's God's will that we work together to bring these things about. End of quote. That was the Pope's message to the Hindus, Muslims, Protestants, and Catholics sent out from the Vatican. I'll give another quote. Those who oppose the New Age movement would likely oppose much of what the Presbyterian Church USA is already doing and saying. Wow. Those were the words of Robert Minnelli, chairman of the committee that chose their slogan for the next five years. And their slogan is, this is the Presbyterian Church, New Age Dawning. That's their five-year plan for evangelism. Another quote, Our age is characterized by the resurgence and renewal of religions in many parts of the globe. Behind this lies a, lies a widespread pessimism about the future of mankind. Our world is in desperate need of a new and larger vision of unity. This was said by Robert Runcie, head or the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Church of England. Now do we begin to see there these things are really happening? This great apostate church is happening. The Catholic Church has 24 organizations within the United Nations organization that is working for world religion, world government. Do you and I think for just a moment that the Catholic Church has changed its way because it had the Vatican II Council in 1962-65? to 65? It is using honey now to collect all of the Protestants to come back to the fold. There was an article that came out in the uh, Tampa Tribune, January 21st, 1992, that stated very clearly that the Vatican says that neither communism or the free market in the United States is correct. And if they had their say-so about it, they would set up the same type of system they had during the Middle Ages. 
Well, during the Middle Ages, they killed true Christians, those who wanted to obey the Bible. Brethren, I believe with all of my heart that we must come out of Babylon. There must be no reservations. When we find that we have been participating in some way or another, a part of Mystery Babylon, we must come out. You know why it is so important and why I say that and I believe it with all of my heart? Listen to the following scripture very carefully. Don't apply it to someone else. Apply it to you. I will apply it to me. To be exact, I'm going to go so far as to say Hebrews 11:35 says there is a better resurrection. You look up the word resurrection, it means to re-stand on your feet. All the dead saints from righteous Abel all the way down at the return of Christ are going to be resurrected. They're going to re-stand on their feet. They're going to be given a new glorified body. In Hebrews 11.35, it says there is a better resurrection. Better resurrection. When you look it up in the Greek, it could be more noble, more serviceable resurrection. It means there is something for those when Jesus Christ returns and they're faithful, they're going to have something better from now on throughout eternity than the rest of mankind that God will have to raise from the dead and pour out his spirit and then teach them the truth. There is something better. And if you or I are not in that better resurrection at the return of Christ, we've missed it. Maybe not eternity, but the better resurrection. Listen to Revelation now, 18. I'll start in verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit, all wicked spirits and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird for all nations we make up a part of the nation, we're individuals all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication this is mystery Babylon, a religious system and its doctrines And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. God has people that still don't understand as much as the people sitting in this room. That you be not partakers of her sins. What if someone that God considers his person does not come out of mystery Babylon? What if they remain in it and they partake of the sins of this system? Notice what he says, and that you receive not of her plagues. Think very carefully. Revelation 11, when the two witnesses are prophesying before this beast system for three and a half years. Suddenly they're killed. And after three days and a half, God resurrects those two persons. They're caught up into the air. The voice said, come up here. And shortly after that, we see the seventh trump sound. What happens at the last trump? The resurrection of the saints. After the saints are resurrected and they're standing on what looks like a sea of glass, Revelation 15, they're standing there. They already have their new body. Then suddenly, seven angels appear and they have the seven last vials that are going to pour out the plagues on this system. If you're not already resurrected and at the sea of glass with Jesus, you are going to be a partaker of these plagues. You cannot be in the first resurrection after that. It's impossible. The door's shut. 
Remember the ten virgins? Remember the marriage supper of the Lamb? Some came and the door was shut already. He didn't open the door. He said it's shut. No more. Nobody else enters. That's the first resurrection, a better resurrection. For her sins have reached unto heaven and God hath remembered her iniquities. And if any of us remain a part of that system, he's going to remember our iniquities because we have not repented and come out. And when you come out, every person you know comes against you. It's just that simple. If the churches of this world were truly God's churches, why do they have it so easy? Simple. If you're on Satan's side, he makes it easy for you. But if you're on God's side, you're on Satan's turf on planet Earth until Jesus returns and takes it back. And therefore, he does everything he can to discourage and destroy you. So I am pleading with everyone to make sure our lives are so right with Jesus Christ that we know that we have repented and come out and will not be partakers of those plagues.